Hello, so today's presentation is how events can be influenced. So as a brief introduction to the project, uh, Reaching People was founded uh, around the first lockdown in the UK. Um, we had concerns what we were seeing and therefore we decided to, or I sort of founded the project and had some assistance. And the three pillars are understanding how to have a good conversation. Now, this isn't how to influence someone, although that information is obviously important to understand and there's ethical questions there, but really how can we hold a conversation where two people can communicate and hopefully the truth can arise? So how do we facilitate that? So that's a big part of the project. How do we message? If we've got an important message to get it out there, how can we reach most people so they can evaluate the message themselves? Uh, this is a very important topic. And thirdly, what we'll be looking at today is behavior and how we're influenced. Uh, the more and more I go into this, the more startling it is and the more stealth that it appears to be. Uh, and the way that the ego is set up, it tends to pretty much dismiss thinking that we can be influenced in the ways that we actually are influenced. And this is obviously problematic because things like advertising, most people will actually say advertising doesn't affect them. Uh, and do not wonder why advertising companies spend billions and billions each year on advertising. It clearly works, um, but we obviously, because most people don't understand the mechanism, they just dismiss it. So this is a very key point we'll, we'll look at today. So just a couple of notes before we get going. Obviously, we're very limited on resources and graphics, etc. So I do my best to put these presentations together. But really, it's substance over style we really there's some really important information that needs to be getting out there um it's pretty much like any time there's a new scientific discovery it tends to change the landscape <clears throat> and changes the game and that's why it's important that we are up to date with what uh is understood about how we function through this series i aim to unravel what drives behavior how it can be influenced and how certain people with huge resources can influence huge amounts of the population and importantly, mostly without their consent or knowledge. Um, this is obviously very, very important. If we're going to live in a sort of free society, then people need to have control over their thoughts, their thinking and their own behavior. So in this presentation, we're going to have a brief overview of what drives our behavior. And then we're going to look at this concept that we're thinking about is which we call the control room. Pretty much the whole world is a stage. <clears throat> And where you've got that control room with the lighting and the cameras and the, you know, curtains, etc., and the director, we're going to see, can someone literally press a few buttons, change a few of, you know, things in an event and actually change the outcome of it? That's the question we want to ask. So this is one of the slides I'm going to start with. It's a very common thing. Most people... Uh, having challenging conversations the last few years, society tends to be polarized more and more. And this slide really explains the reason for this. And in this slide, we have Jane Bloggs and we have her brother Joe Bloggs. Now, as they're having a conversation, they're really only aware, you know, of what they're speaking about. But if we look much deeper into what's going on, they're both effectively standing on a soapbox, metaphorically speaking. And the soapbox represents all of their knowledge, their memory. It's the reservoir of all their belief systems, you know, just pretty much like a hard drive that contains all their knowledge. And it's not until we take a look into the soapbox that you can see why people have challenging conversations, because it's effectively we have different belief systems. Now, really, the really important point to understand is a belief system is not truth. It's an opinion of truth. And to understand that distinction is really important because, you know, I've been doing a lot of work the last few months looking into my own soapbox and pretty particularly the shadow part of it, which is, you know, hidden to us. And it kind of surprised me how much stuff in there that's not strictly true besides. And it does drive our behavior. And that's what's really important. So if we look into these two soapboxes, but first, if we say that every time they look at a fact, you're looking at that fact through your own perspective. So through your own unique perspective and that those two things, there are magnifying glasses looking at a particular fact. And what we also do is we project whatever's in our soapbox, I, our knowledge into the conversation. So if you thought two plus two equaled five, that is what you would be projecting to the conversation. 
and that is what you would be perceiving mathematics through. So if we looked into Joe's soapbox, and let's say Joe believes, uh, and these are just two typical people on opposing sides of the fence. So let's say Joe believes that the media reports the truth. Let's say that he thinks the government serves him. He thinks that science is solid and, and cannot be corrupted. He thinks if anybody says something safe, then it must be. Trust the institutions. He thinks there's checks and balances in place. And he thinks there's a consensus. Now, that's really a key point, because if somebody hasn't released data, which happened during the last few years, how can there be a consensus? There can only be the people that have seen the data. So it's really important that the illusion of consensus is one of the biggest drivers for people believing what they believe. So if we looked into Jane's soapbox and she's in pretty much the opposing view, she believes that there's lots of censorship going on. She thinks there's conflicts of interests across the board. Um, she thinks that non-government organizations are having their fingers in lots of pies. She thinks media is a corporation and is thus you know, serves the corporate masters. She distrusts her government and she knows that science can be influenced just as much as any other industry. So these belief systems will literally cloud how anyone sees a fact. So these two people will look at a piece of data and see it completely differently. Now, there was a very famous quote that went along the lines of, we don't believe what we see, we see what we believe. And there's so much to that, more than meets the eye, in fact, in that <clears throat> when we're looking at data, it's so distorted by our belief systems that we really, uh, it's very, very difficult to be objective. But hopefully through this slide, <clears throat> excuse me, you can see that this is what drives most disagreements in conversations. Now, if you actually do want to get through to someone, placing more and more facts in front of them really won't have any effect unless it starts to change the filters by which the facts are viewed. And this is where uh, there's a very good book called Subliminal by uh, Leonard Milodno. And he talks about there being two aspects of mind, which is one's like a lawyer and one's like a scientist. Now, the scientist pretty much looks at the data and then rises at a conclusion, whereas the lawyer will take sides and then prove that their side is correct. And generally what happens is that most people in a conversation act like a lawyer. They've already made their decision and they're just trying to convince you that they're correct. And of course, we need to really be much more of a scientific viewpoint in that we drive to our conclusions from the data and not the other way around. And really that was the classic, what Sherlock Holmes quote was. He says that, you know, I can't remember what exactly, but people, you know, find data to fit their theories rather than finding the theory to fit the data. So <clears throat> there's one really, I find very powerful model that if we ever look at before we look at how we're influenced, it will answer a lot of questions. And it's the metaphor of having the three aspects of our mind. And Joe here, um, as he stands there, there's actually three parts of his mind that when we look at them distinctively differently, we will understand what drives him a lot better. So we've got the conscious or rational mind. And we pretty much are under the illusion that we're in complete conscious control of ourselves. But if we really looked at it a lot deeper, you know, do we always eat exactly what we want to eat? Do we always act in exactly the ways we want to act? And the answer to that question is certainly for myself is no. And I think for most people could admit we're not always able to control ourselves. We've got the monkey part of the mind which really is there for safety. So anytime that, you know, we're in a, an event where we're threatened in any way, you'll have this sort of animal part of mind that take over and you won't be conscious or rational, but you will be acting in a way to protect yourself. And this, in my opinion, is the most important part. And it's the map or in this picture is representing a GPS. And what happens is, is that the conscious mind and both the monkey, how do they know what is true? How do they know what information to refer to? And that's in the map. So if we looked at one of the typical examples in the pandemic, uh, masks, for instance, I'm on the opinion they are not effective in any way and probably compromise their health. That's my opinion. And, and I think a lot of the science supports that. But let's just say that Joe believes that masks work. That information masks work would be in his map in this gps system now if he 
then also had a piece of information in there that said that someone not wearing a mask is dangerous to me that would signal threat and then you would see him become very irrational and the gorilla would take over and it's instances like this where you can see people go from very rational to gorilla almost instantly and it will happen whenever they're threatened either physically or egotistically threatened so if you told someone they're wrong that'd be a threat to the ego and you would very quickly see the gorilla in most instances so the key to this is that I think the real power of the conscious mind is to start programming ourselves. Our map is programmed from we were born to the present day. And for certainly the first 16 years, you could argue that we didn't have much control over that. Um, but when we become an adult, it then becomes our responsibility to make sure that our map contains, you know, information that allows us to live correctly or certainly well. Um, and the map is not right or wrong. It's just an enabler to, uh, to help us navigate through the world. And if we look at this model here, and this is really just looking at how we make decisions. So let's say that Joe had two decisions. Um, you know, do I take pathway A or pathway B? What happened during the pandemic is that this over the left signals drives so let's say that the general narrative, uh, and I'm not going to comment whether it's true or not, but the general narrative was that there's something very dangerous that would create emotions, forcing Joe to act. And Joe generally had a lot of binary decisions, which was comply with what he was told to do or to not comply. Now, pretty much most countries around the world, pathway A was painted with Teflon, making it really easy and very popular. And pathway B was painted with sludge, and sometimes there wasn't even a pathway. In some countries, you weren't even allowed to shop unless you complied with any requests. Now, obviously, you know, complying always has a reason or an excuse, whatever that may be. And it's up for each person to, you know, evaluate whether that's valid or not. But the key point is, is that I don't think people were fully aware of most people's decisions were not conscious. A lot of people were acting from the gorilla part of their mind because they were basically scared. And in the UK, it was done intentionally by the nudge unit. And of course, how do they know to be scared? Because the information in the map. So if Joe is going to choose pathway A or B, if someone is playing around with his map and intentionally scaring him into the gorilla, they are influencing him. And the question is, if he's aware and if he's consensual in this and i think that's a very important question so then if we conclude from what we've spoke about that really what's in the map is of the utmost importance if you think that you know standing next to someone's going to kill you then you're not going to stand next to someone and it's going to cause a lot of stress in someone's life so the information that we hold on our map is really really key so the soapbox effectively is you know, the metaphorical representation of the map. And of course, the whole role of propaganda is to interact with the map. Propaganda isn't designed to consciously change someone. It's really to influence people. And a lot of the time this happens beyond this line. And this line is the liminal line. And liminal is, <clears throat> you know, relating to or situated a sensory threshold, a barely perceptible or capable of eliciting a response. So anything subliminal is basically outside of our awareness. So what I think happens is that we are so attached to our map that we don't see that a distinction that what we believe isn't necessarily true, that if someone does get us to believe something that's not true, this is what led Voltaire to say, if you can convince me of absurdities, I can commit atrocities. And because the way that the ego functions in that it's a large portion of the ego and really the mind is designed for safety it's not designed for truth and what's really fascinating about this is one of the most important things within the psyche is actually social acceptance and it's almost as important as safety so what happens is is that we believe what we believe and we think it's true so therefore we think it's very hard for people to fool us and this is what led Mark Twain to say it's easier to fool people than convince them they've been fooled. 
because most of us aren't aware that we're being influenced by the information coming into our unconscious mind. Um, I mean, there's over the next few series and parts, I'm going to be showing, I mean, I've been through so many studies recently. I mean, just one at the top of my mind is that they played music in a supermarket and they would play French or German music. And when they played French music, the sale of French wine went up considerably. And then we played German music, the same happened. Now, this happened outside of people's conscious awareness, which is was provable time and time again when they run studies on so many different areas of this. And Darren Brown and many other sort of mind magicians have proved this time and time again. But what is startling is that when people are asked whether the information affected them, they always say no. And there's so many studies around showing us that what happens is when we're asked to justify a decision, what the mind does is often it reaches for a socially acceptable answer. Because this is what so much of the ego is doing. It's trying to fit in. And you can understand evolutionary wise why that's important, because a couple of thousand years ago, if you got excluded from the tribe or the clan, it would probably be quite difficult to survive. So one of the biggest drivers really is being socially accepted. And there's a, the whole theory of social exclusion theory shows that it's really quite traumatic to be excluded from society, which is why one of the biggest drivers is basically to demonize anyone that doesn't comply with any requests. So hopefully that, you know, this is a really large subject touching on, but it's really how it's quite straightforward for a person to fool themselves. And a lot of the time it can happen without our knowledge. So then we are bringing this rather interesting concept of, of the control room. So if we can be influenced, what are the things that influence us? Are there dials, metaphorically speaking? Are there buttons that someone could press to influence another person's behavior? And this comes up with one of the most important subjects in psychology, which is the person versus the situation. Now, that on the right is obviously a rather funny representation of the toilet roll run that happened in the UK. And I don't know if it happened in any other country, but effectively, when something is perceived to be scarce, people tend to go and try and hoard it. So, you know, this has happened time and time again in the UK. They just announce a petrol shortage or whatever shortage it is, and it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy because people just go out and buy it all. Um, and a lot of the time, you know, they they buy it much more than they need, and that creates the panic. So the flow of goods really has a certain time period to it. And if that changes, then obviously the supply does not meet the demand. So the first one button could be time. We're going to look at. And there's a very famous study from social psychology, which is the Good Samaritan, which uh, this picture represents. Now, the Good Samaritan was a study where they were studying uh, theology students and they split them up into three different groups. And they did a, um, a personality test, everything else to represent. Was it the person or the situation that controlled the behavior? They split them into three different groups. They sp split them into a group that were told that they had lots of time, another group that told they were on time, and another group that told they had to hurry and they were running late. And then what they did was they gave, they put an actor on the journey uh, who was feigned assistance uh, and in need of a good Samaritan. And what they found was that the people that were in a, in a rush, only 10% of those stopped, whereas the ones that had loads of time, 65% of those stopped. So what you found was that just the time button actually changed people's behavior. And they did a comparison with, you know, half of them were actually told they were going to do a lecture on the Good Samaritan. And that obviously increased um, the chances that they would stop. But as you can see, um, it was really if they were in a rush, there was a much less chance that the person would actually stop. Now, what they concluded was that the time rush actually narrowed the cognitive map. It really focused them on the task at hand. And obviously there's a famous old quote that says, give them bread and circus and they never revolt, which is, you know, where is our attention? Now, button two in this, you know, metaphorical control room, we're going to look at as authority. 
And obviously one of the most famous studies on this is Milgram, but there's many of them. And Milgram's study was set up in such a way that a person was told they were going to give an electric shock to another person. It was actually an actor and it wasn't connected. And the actor was feigning being hurt when the buttons were pressed. But the real study was to determine whether someone would actually press the button just because someone in authority told them to do so. Now, the results of the study were startling. They have been replicated um, numerous times. And, you know, you've only got to look over the last few years to see a real world um, use of this. But the real point that not many people focus on, I think is really important, is that Milgram actually surveyed a lot of experts prior to running his studies. And he asked them how many people would press the button that would potentially fatally hurt another person. And the general consensus was that less than 1% of people would press the button. It actually turned out to be 65% of people pressing the button. Now, that is, again, the startling vortex, the gap between what we think people would do and what people actually would do. And that's why behavioral sciences have made a, you know, startling advances over the last couple of decades, because they stopped listening to what people said and they started watching what they did. Largely, people's explanation of why they do things isn't always that accurate. And, and it can be if we start to really understand what drives us. But I think one of the most telling studies in this respect is, um, is around social proof again. So what they did was they designed a study to determine in a hotel room which sign would be the most effective at getting people to recycle the towels. And they did this numerous times to work out what was the most effective sign. So they knew what the best one was. Then what they did was they surveyed people to ask them what would be the best message. And in fact, the best message people rated as being the least effective. So that's really quite startling. The one that worked the most, people said it would work the least. And, and it really was social proof. And the sign was you know, X amount of people recycle their towels. Oh, if everyone else is doing it, I should do it as well. Now that happens at such an unconscious level and you've only got to look around. We dress the same, we do, the, you know, it's a lot of the actions that we do is to not to stand out or be rejected from society. Now, another study around here was quite fascinating was in the in a natural forest. Uh, a lot of petrified wood was being stolen. So they put up three, uh, three signs. One of the signs was blank. One sign said, you know, please don't steal the wood. The other sign said, you know, seven tons a month or whatever gets stolen or a year or whatever it was. Um, and that actually increased the theft. Actually telling people how much was being stolen increased it threefold, I think it was. And of course, at first, that seems crazy. But in fact, when you understand how social proof works, it's effectively, oh, if everyone else is doing it, I might as well do it as well. And that's probably why, you know, when you look at any sort of industries, when some of them are, you know, uh, you know, people are not doing ethical behavior, I think a lot of the time it's because of their peers are doing the same. So number three, button three, conformity of social proof. And obviously, we just touched on this with a few of those studies. But one of the most famous was Solomon Ash's study, where he would get a group of six or seven people in a room, six, of, you know, there was only one person in the study, the rest of them were actors. And what he did was he get all the actors to actually answer a question, but they on purpose answered incorrectly to see if that would influence the other person to answer incorrectly. And it did significantly. And, and then they found out that if, if, if one person answered the correct, then that was enough to sway a lot of people to actually stand their ground. And this really does explain why censorship is so problematic and so important to narratives. Because if you can censor those standing up, then no one's got any reference point to stand up. It makes sense because the few people that do stand up massively influence other people to do so. Uh, it's really, really key. So conformity is massively important. And so many people base their decision on what other people do. So if the media can convince people that the so-called right thing to do or the most common thing to do popular is A, then most people will choose A. And a lot of the <clears throat> propaganda around the 
pandemic actually focused on this. I've seen some actual documents that said that they were forcing certain timelines to get as many people in for a first instance of something so they could get the numbers up to convince other people to do so. Um, but um, for scarcity, which is hugely, hugely powerful. And obviously, you know, this is an example of scarcity. And you'll see it time and time again, you know, people queue up outside shops all night to buy something that's in, you know, high demand and small supply. There's something in the unconscious mind that if there's not much of something, you know, the desire for it goes up significantly. And then you'd probably noticed in the pandemic that every product that came out was under supplied, supposedly so. I mean, it was always, you know, in high demand and short supply. So in summary, what we effectively have is the all world's a stage with lots of actors. You've got these directors and you have a control room. And if you can press these buttons on large scale, then it is possible to shift behavior in a large amount of the population and a lot of the time beyond their awareness. And of course, like any show and theater, once you see behind the curtain, once you see it's always show, it no longer takes you or grasps you. And I think that's what a lot of people are seeing. How much of it is a show? I mean, that's everyone's individual you know, opinion to decide. Uh, and my role here is just to show the mechanism by which it can happen. And, and some of the, the studies will really show that the compliance goes from small numbers to startlingly high numbers. It's not that it changes things five or 10%. I mean, the commitment principle, one of the buttons, literally takes compliance from about 17 to 75% on average. And that is startling. So in summary, it is important to understand the three aspects of mind metaphor to understand behavior. Now, we've been working on processes to literally take control and update the maps. We can do it ourselves because, for instance, if your map says water is dangerous, but you know consciously it's not, it doesn't make any difference. If you have a phobia of water, the phobic response is going to kick in until the map is updated. So we move away from, you know, pain and towards pleasure, but not the actual pain and pleasure, the perceived pain and pleasure. And how do you know that something is pleasurable or painful? Because it's in the map. And advertising effectively, why do people go and buy junk food? Because they've got positive associations with it. When they think about it, it makes them feel good, even when afterwards it may not make them feel good. Much of what influences people happens subliminally. We're going to do a number of presentations on this. It's really quite startling that our environment affects us so, so massively, but it makes perfect sense. I mean, when you look at how the body and the mind functions, it's really important that we take in lots of the data, but our conscious mind isn't able to do that. So, so much is taken in unconsciously, and then it gets filtered via these processes. And number three, by understanding the button, situations and events can be influenced, manipulated to create outcomes according to a pre-planned agenda. If you know how people are going to respond to an event or situation and then creating that event or situation in a specific way, you can pretty much predict what outcome you will get in many situations. Um, and I think that is obviously quite troublesome, but I think if that's understood by everyone, then the theatre plays out differently. So that's why I think it's very important to understand that. So, uh, and number four, most of this will be denied by the rational mind until it sees it. Uh, anyone that's seen the uh, selective attention test with the gorilla walking across the screen, people say there was no gorilla in there. You literally have to rewind it to show them that the gorilla was always there. Because they, I must have seen it. How could I miss the gorilla? Because we were distracted. And it's actually about 50% of people miss the gorilla. So that concludes today's presentation. Um, these Zooms are free, obviously um, trying to fund this project to expand it and to get the stuff done. So if you do want to support us, you can donate here. Or if you would want some one-on-one -on -one sessions or workshops, please visit the website or email me. Uh, I'm going to open up the Q&A and stop recording.